I'm uh, Patrick S. Ditko, and Steve's my brother. And I'm Patrick J. Ditko. I'm Steve Ditko's nephew. Welcome back to Comic Book Historians. I'm Alex Grand. Go ahead and click on that juicy red subscribe button down below. And don't forget to check out my book, Understanding Superhero Comic Books. I went on a very special trip to Johnstown, Pennsylvania on a special quest a week before the Ditko Con to interview some family members of the late Steve Ditko, the co-creator of Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. And through Patrick Ditko, his nephew, we were able to sit and chat and interview Pat Ditko, Steve Ditko's younger brother. And through him and Patrick, we we're able to get as close to a biographical interview as we could get about the late Steve Ditko. This interview includes a lot of photos and footage of Steve Ditko that no one's ever seen. So get ready for comic history that you've never seen before. So we want to really kind of unravel, you know, who was Steve Ditko? It's like this enigma out there that a lot of people kind of wonder about. And you guys probably knew him better than anyone else, as well as he probably could have been known, maybe. So first, Steve Ditko, he's a Scorpio, born November 2nd, 1927. You're his younger brother by about seven years or yeah. so? Yeah. What are your earliest memories of Steve? I, I really don't know when, I, you know, my earliest memories were all i know is uh, steve was my brother and my hero and uh, he did chores around the house and i was his first helper and uh you know he had chores to do and i followed him around you know so i would know what i had to do when he left not knowing that he would go from the service I mean, from the school right into the service. So when he left, I was like uh, sort of devastated. I said, holy cow, i got to do all this stuff that I hope I get it right, do it right. So and there was just a lot of things to do. And I, I don't remember anything specific, just what I had to do. How, and how old was he when he left? He was 18. Okay, so you were about like 11 then. Yeah, that time. yeah. Yeah. Your parents, your father served in the military. Was that in World War One? Yes. Steve was named after your guys' dad, Steve. Yes. I, yeah, I assume, yes. Yeah. And then your mother's name is Anna. Anna, yes. Anna Ditko. And then Steve Ditko was born one year into their marriage. Yes. Is that right? So uh -huh. your dad, Steve, worked at a steel mill. Is that the kind of the income source? Yeah, he was a, like a troubleshooter for the mill. He went all around. On the side, he was a he was a master carpenter. He build houses and do remodeling, all, all kind of stuff. So he he wasn't around much. He was around, but uh, Steve did all the tough jobs that had to be done that he could have done and should have done. Yeah, but he was out earning money. And when you say remodeling, what do you mean? Well, he'd go to somebody's house and then say, "Well, we want to put a picture window in here." So I see. he take the job and go and like construct yeah. something that well, requires conditions, a room addition oh, and, yeah. and roofs, I see. new roof, new roofing oh, okay. jobs. We were crazy there. We had so oh, many to do. And that kind of takes engineering, understanding the dimensions of what you're working with. That was kind of a everyday thing for him. Yeah, so. all I did was listen and do what he told me. Kind of worked with him then. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I got all the tough jobs when it comes to doing roofing. I had to. In those days, you put a, sh a quarter of a shingle in the gutters, and I was the guy that had to do the gutters. I cut the shingles and did all that stuff. I did mm -hmm. the hard part, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> and you're an architect yourself, yes. and that was your profession. Yes. And I see from the architecture of your house, there's a lot of geometric spirals that you designed. And then I know in Patrick's art that there's a lot of geometric spirals in your art, and there's a lot of geometric spirals in Steve Ditko's art that we've seen in a lot of his kind of more metaphysical comics. So that's a geometric similarity that I just find that interesting. Oh. Steve himself was called JR sometimes. Depending Sorry. on who you ask. Yeah. Yeah. And then there is also JD as Junior Ditko also. So yeah. depending on which side of the family 
that was referring to him. Yeah, and I had another name for him. What was your name? I called him Yun or Yunik. What did that mean? I don't know. I just called him that. I don't know why. I it was a friendly kind of term. That. Oh, you... well, yeah, and I called my older sister Inca, who was Anna Marie, and then um, my other sister Betty. I called her Buzzy, which yeah. she hated. Yeah. It chased me all over. Are these kind of like a Eastern European kind of? Uh, no, I don't know what they are. I just know. The kind of pet names you had. You yeah, <laughs> exactly. Steve Sr., his father's name was Wasil. Wasil. Immigrant from Slovakia. Ukraine. From the Ukraine. Yes. The Byzantine Catholic religion. Yes. Basically, yeah. Was there a certain kind of hardworking ethic and not really talking about it much, but just working a lot? Is that correct? I have to say yes, because... Uh, uh, I'm that way. It didn't matter. I just worked. It didn't. You know, I did whatever I had to, and and my father was the same way. He was always working, and uh, you know, he was doing the same thing. He did everything around the house. So uh, I'm sure it's somehow it's inherited, but I, I don't. It seemed like no matter what age Steve Ditko was, he was always working on something, always doing something with his art form, and so it just seemed like that's a trait that you guys all kind of shared. I guess World War Two. He went off to the service, you said, and also you guys had some uncles that also served yes. in World War II. So was this a bit of a family trait at that time that it was a proud thing to do? Was it part of a draft or was it part of... Uh, I don't know what it was, but they just, they went in, you know. I think my uncles were drafted, but Steve wasn't. Yeah, so he did that on yeah. to do it. Yeah. Yeah, and this was after the atom bomb dropped, right? Yes. So was there some relationship between the atom bomb dropping... And then him serving, was there any sort of relationship there? No, not that I know of. Yeah. We have different kind of themes of questions, somewhat chronological, but not necessarily. There, there's a certain sense of analysis, of, of kind of analyzing a problem, using kind of a mixture of math and creativity to solve problems. And to me, it seems like when he was designing his characters, designing pages, I feel like he was composing those pages like the way a filmmaker would in a very analytical kind of similar way did you ever kind of look at a lot of his stuff as it was kind of coming out first of all you know when he uh uh went to the service and then went to the to new york yeah and he come back and uh the first things and my mother told me this so i know it's true that he says what happens in new york stays in new york i don't want to talk about it yeah so that's how the whole family just, that New York, we didn't know even where it was, <laughs> <laughs> except I had a bunch of uncles that lived out there. As far as comics, my dad was a, he was a fanatic. He loved comic books. Yeah. So. He, he, did he share that with Steve then, the, the comic stuff? Well, that? Steve came in and, and that was it. I mean, he, he really didn't say too much about my dad. He was just, he sat in that chair on a Sunday, and he read comic books all day long, and uh, that was it. And uh, on uh, payday, I'd meet him halfway down the street, and he'd give me money to go buy some more comics. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And what kind of comics were you grabbing for? I picked anything he liked. He didn't it didn't matter what he uh -huh. what I brought him. He, you know, and I just picked him out randomly. And then uh, Batman. I, I've Batman heard, was yeah. a big one. That was the big one. Comics and, Detective Comics. Uh, the Spirit. The Spirit, yeah. And the Human Torch and all. Yeah, all oh, okay, so like the timely Human yeah. Torch kind of Marvel stuff too. Uh -huh. And you know, Alex, I just wanted to throw in too that when my dad says, you know, he never talked about New York and that he yeah. didn't bring the comic books home, I do want to clarify that that was true all up until Mr. A because when he self-produced Mr. A, I remember as a kid, Mr. A is being around the house. Oh, that's cool. And the same thing with Static. is When he did Static, yeah. he brought back Static comic books for everybody. Yeah. He, saw, he gave a signed Static to me and my brothers and sisters. Yeah. And it seemed like when he was producing his own stuff later in the 70s and 80s, he did bring that work home. I see. So it's like the stuff that he owned. Yeah. He, he sent a lot, lot of comics to me, too. Well, that's interesting because then that then there's a distinction. It sounds like there is, and I want to make that point because stuff that was work for hire versus stuff that he created that he owned the copyright yep. to.
And he sent a lot to Rick, Ricky and yeah, Parkinson. he shared that that independently published stuff that were his characters with the family because uh -oh. he was probably pretty proud of that. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's almost like there was like, well, that was a job I did for that person, uh, so that so was that's work. Not mine, or in a way. But then when it was his thing, he brought it, and uh, that's a really great um, distinction to make, which. Because we have ever signed Mr. A's and signed Statics yeah. as well. Like, yeah. so people, oh, like he never his. signed anything. Yeah, like well, he did his. sign things. He, signed he never brought comic books home. Well, but he did. He brought Mr. A and he I brought see. Static home. When, when you kind of were hanging out with him as a kid, did he show signs that he was a very analytical person uh, that you can remember? He was my brother. Like yeah. I said, he was, he was my boss and hero. I had read in the book that you guys are putting together with uh, Bob Jashanik. Um, that he worked on airplane models. Oh yeah. Um, that which takes some level of engineering, from my perspective. There was a story of finishing a puzzle, but then there was a missing piece, so he crafted a piece yeah. to fit that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, to me, that's showing me some sort of like an analyzing it and breaking down to what's missing, yeah. and then filling the need. Right. To me, it seems that way. Yeah. He was uh, in that airplane club at Garfield, where he made those models. And I could kick myself because of all the things I should have saved, I didn't save. Because he, I'll never forget, he made that flying tiger. Oh, yeah, flying tiger. Uh -huh. The Messerschmitt uh -huh. and the Japanese Zero. Oh. Those three I had, they were, uh, <laughs> and I don't know what, I kicked myself. Probably fragile. Yeah. Well, yeah, probably. But anyway, I, I remember those. He had a science lab in the barn of the house that you guys grew up in. It seemed there was like there was kind of a locked door. There was chemistry sets. Education seemed important. His own studio here yeah, it was, as yeah, a kid. Exactly. And uh, was he pretty private about that room then? Uh, it was locked. It was locked, right? You there. couldn't get in there. No way. From what I understand, there was like a Bunsen burner in their fingerprint. Analysis not, not stuff. a Bunsen burner, because I don't think they even had them. There. But he had he had a candle in there. It was you know that he used as a Bunsen burner that he used to like cook chemicals yeah. around yeah. for the uh, the tubes, and, you know, yeah. test tubes, test tubes full yeah. of chemicals. And then he all kind of slides for uh, all bugs, hairs, yeah, microscope, yeah, microscope. Yeah, the microscope. There yeah. you go. And uh, he had all kinds of stuff in there. <laughs> it feels like Peter Parker experimenting with webbing and experimenting with devices and things. So with the fingerprints and chemicals, was that like him training to be a detective in a way? Was he thinking like a detective at that yeah. point? But, you know, when I first uh, read Spider-Man and uh, Peter Parker, I told everybody, that's Steve Ditko. Yeah. Yeah, so you because, felt that. Yeah, I immediately. As soon yeah. as I read that story, I said, that's Steve Ditko. Because it seemed consistent with his, his behavior as a teenager. Yeah, just about. And it seemed like with him, there's this kind of mixture of art and science, which I think is kind of unique. Interestingly enough, we have the books that he used as reference yeah. to develop. What he ended up doing was fingerprinting in note cards himself his oh, brother yeah oh, that's cool his sister uh -huh. so this and is, a neighbor I see. So that this a cousin. everyone's yeah. fingerprints yep. cousin. yeah oh cousin. Uh -huh. cousin yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a, so you know and it very meticulous you've got the the name and then the the, the print on each page uh -huh. i mean uh -huh. extremely thorough yeah he, he got a, a file on everyone. He yes. Was like. <laughs> he was collecting all the pertinent information. <laughs> in the household of the 40s and the, the 50s, what were the politics of the household? Were they like kind of pro-FDR, pro-Truman? Were they kind of more against FDR? Against There's no politics. No politics of the house. So they were talk, it wasn't really talked about like no, that. The radio come on, you watch, you either listen to The Shadow or The Lone Ranger. Okay, that's cool. And the news... I don't even, I don't remember listening to news At when all, I was yeah. a kid. It sounds like fiction and storytelling was kind of a fun part of the yeah. household. And then you said The Shadow and The Lone Ranger. Is that something that you guys were all listening to together? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. We had a coal stove in the kitchen, and uh, my mother would turn on the heat yeah. and to heat up the oven. And then she'd open the door, and I'd get a chair, and I'd put the 
chair behind me and sit with my back towards the oven and watch. <laughs> listen. Yeah. yeah, and listen. Yeah, because it was so yeah. cold, but yeah. you want to hear what's going oh, on, yeah, too. Yeah. Do you happen to recall any of Steve's reactions to any of those storylines, or is it just more of a family activity? Just Yeah, everybody just, just sort of quiet and listened. There's one thing about Steve that seems to come up is that he didn't necessarily brag about his accomplishments, but he wanted the work to speak for itself. Right. Is that, would you consider that somewhat of a family trait as well then? I would on myself, and I know Patrick's the same way. I know that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I would. Yeah, that the work speaks for itself. I don't know how far it goes, you know, but. Okay, I gotcha. Religion. So. Steve Ditko was baptized in the Byzantine Catholic Church. Is that right? Yes. Was religion a strong part of his... Uh... Well, at home it was to a point. I don't know when he stopped. But Was it know, after he went to the service? Yeah, probably. And then when he uh, went to the service, then he came home and went to New York. It was like, uh, well, he couldn't... I don't think he, he could find a Byzantine Catholic Church out there. Right, right. But, you know, when he was living in New York, uh, Joan and I, they, we had some kind of an affair down at church where they were making a trip to New York. So we went to New York, right. and first thing in our mind was we're going to go check on Uncle Steve, you know. Yeah. So we did. We knocked on the door. He opened it up, not full. He opened it up. And, of course, when he saw us, he says, oh, gee, he closed the door right away. And he says, let's go. So he took us to St. Patrick's Cathedral. Oh, okay. He said, I've got to show you this. And uh, we went there, and then uh, we had lunch. But you didn't go inside. At church. No, no, but inside his place. No. Uh -uh. Yeah, he was like, he, he carefully right closed out. it behind him. Yeah. Hey, let's get yep. out of here. Yeah. Okay, I got you. And yep. I don't remember where his studio was at the time. But anyway. We went to St. Pat's Cathedral and then uh, went to lunch. And uh, we had a, a room at the hotel. So we invited him up. So he'd come up and we spent a couple hours with us yakking. Then he left. Do you think he became atheist or more like agnostic? I, I don't think he had. Uh, no, I don't. I, I wouldn't even guess. Yeah. So because it never really came up. No. And it wasn't really that big of a deal to him. No, uh, only probably to my mother, you know, that's oh, all. And uh, oh. if there was anything said between him and her, I wouldn't even know. I see. So that it was more like a family custom of yes. hanging out. Like there's a baptism, I'm going to show up. But he was godfather for yeah. Mark and Steve. Yeah. So he went to the service and participated in the entire baptismal service. Exactly. Yeah. But and you had to be in good standing to, to be a godfather. Yeah. So was he ever, was he... Slated to be anybody else's godfather that well, he wasn't allowed? Yes, there was one. I'm not trying to think who it is. I forget. It would have been Helena. Helena. Yeah. Because I, I, so I, I thought I had remembered something about Yeah, this. Helena was going to be baptized, and uh, um, Steve went, I, well, I went with him to Father Sabo's, and uh, Father Sabo says, well, he, I, I don't know if you're I, in good standings with the church. And he says, I'll have to get back to you. Well, Oh, he said that to Steve? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, he never did. <laughs> so, so that tells you what so, his standing was. I see. So what, what would it take to disqualify you from being in good standing? So if you think about it in those times without an internet, yeah. old school communications yeah. yeah if you were going to be baptized and someone in your family was going to be a godfather yeah. they were probably in the same church in another town okay. and you would just yeah. you'd, all the priests knew each yeah. other priests you'd call yeah. up yeah. and say hey father sam yeah. this is father sabo from johnstown pennsylvania i yeah. want to see if steve ditko can be godfather yeah. here and he'd say oh yeah steve's here every sunday right. and it was a done deal yeah. But if it was, I don't know who that guy is. Well, I know so much for a fact, uh, all our godparents is, uh, I'm talking about me and my two sisters I, and Steve, we all are from the same church. Mm. So it was no big deal. So you, you normally kept it in that tight community not only, anyway. Not only that, so you didn't it, really need to verify. Most it. of the time it was family. 
it just means that he wasn't really going to church is really what that and means. that was enough that was enough to not be in good standing to, for father sabo yeah right and do you think that left a poor taste in his mouth uh, I would about say, the church as a whole i would say it did i, see. I know it did me so it had to do oh. him <laughs> so there was something about a restriction of freedom that he, he didn't like that aspect of it probably and as far as his religious views, I think he was, you know, uh, he explored all of the all of the different religions, and he took into account all of those points of view. I've been guilty myself of trying to pigeonhole Steve Ditko in the Ayn Rand camp, and after reading Zach Cruz's book, I, I kind of opened my mind up to the fact that Doctor Strange is certainly not Randian by any means, and I think you have to look at Steve's view in a broader picture. Yeah. It wasn't that he was atheist and that he didn't like Catholics or did like yeah, Catholics. Yeah. It's not really one or the yeah, other, yeah, yeah. that he could take it all in. We mentioned some of the comic stuff that was around as a kid. You mentioned Batman. I know that he was trained by Jerry Robinson. So Jerry Robinson's Batman was kind of a big deal. And then Dick Tracy also. Oh, yeah, Dick Tracy. Yeah, Dick Tracy was a, was a big comic strip in the household, yeah. He was cutting out parts of the comics and keeping it. Like, he was kind of collecting... The material in a way right yeah what's that's it here Show yeah a couple of them so this is interesting because yeah. you have like the you know the 97 thing. pound weakling charles atlas yeah. and then you have batman here yeah. and then uh this is interesting like these characters that he was kind of you know saving um and uh i like the precision the on like this though too to yeah. get that to to want to be able to see just that image right you know oh yeah like that's an exploration there it is that's not just yeah i'm gonna cut that out right right <laughs> it was um interesting yeah, the yeah, yeah. yeah batman is a real big deal for him yeah uh, which is uh which is really fascinating because that's um oh that's cool you got the lev gleason claw um that was part of this so this is this is his stuff uh, from uh, the 40s that he cut up himself. Um, well, you know so. what? He was known to do that a lot. Uh -huh. He cut up his stuff. Yeah. And then I just look at all these little, look at all these little corners he was saving. Gee, right. If that doesn't remind you of something that soon comes to be in the corner of yeah. every comic book. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because this kind of reminds me of the Marvel letterboxes that he designed, right? Which is just fascinating to me. Um, and that he would have that many of them. Yeah. That was something that was yeah. like he like was that. making a, a a hard impression for himself. There. Yeah, that there is like something to trademark here. Yes, right, and trademark and art. There was a value commercial. in that little piece of real estate commercial. on the on the cover. Interesting. Stephen means a crown. That's interesting. That it's Stephen. Ah, the name on there, right? Yeah, I'm sure. That's oh, why it was oh. there. You know, and uh, I wanted to see what this was. I, oh. Well, that's a pretty, pretty near, near. Clancy the cop. That's cool. And then you have Batman back here, of course. Uh huh. So this is, uh, this is great. Oh yeah, the one and only Superman. So Superman was an influence, but it seems like he liked Batman probably more. Yeah. Is what it's, uh, is what it's looking like here. And look at that. You got like still kind of the ads, the comic ads, the comic advertising stuff. You guys played out characters too. Would you play out some of these characters together? No, I, I, that, that, that's a little bit of a misconception. Mm -hmm. Steve palled around with Mike Matolak. He was across, lived across the street. And they were good buddies. And somehow, somehow they got the, somebody started them with their Batman and Robin because they're oh. so close. And, mm -hmm. But one day I ran, I went into the drugstore up here and there was this, this lady sitting on a uh, chair there waiting for her prescription. And I says, Mary Jane, how are you? And she looks at me. She says, I'm fine. Who are you? I says, I'm Batman's brother. Oh, yeah. She says, oh, Patty. That was like his nickname, kind of Batman. Or well, I don't know. But it, she right away, you know, acknowledged it. So. It's just interesting that that would be like a nickname for him, Batman. Do you remember any of the fiction books that he was possibly reading at the time? Was he, did he ever look at Tarzan or, or Pulps or anything like that? He, I know he was a fan of Tarzan because he's from Wimber. Yeah, Johnny Weissmiller is from about 30 minutes away. That's cool. Yeah, and uh, I know he was a big fan of his. 
I, was there a comic book on? Yeah, they had comic strips, and then they had some comic books too on Tarzan. But that's great because he he was at the the cartoonist and illustrator school, which was kind of founded by Bern Horgoth, who was a big Tarzan artist. Uh-huh. And one of my thoughts has been that maybe the the web swinging in the New York, the jungle of New York, is uh-huh. could be related to Tarzan swinging on vines. That was my thought process uh-huh. because of that of where he trained and yeah. Bern and Tarzan. But but Johnny Weissmiller being even local, more. And that's Tarzan even more would have so. been in the forefront yeah. of if, in and that's cool. And it sounds like it's like the movie Tarzan, too, that he was it, also it, watching, oh, right? Yeah, we yeah. watched a lot of those. Yeah, what, lot. what were some other... So Tarzan, what other movies did you guys kind of watch? I don't know. The Lone Ranger was on Lone TV. Ranger, yeah. Flash Gordon serials. Did you Flash guys watch Gordon, that stuff? Yes. Okay, so Flash Gordon. Uh-huh. Yeah. Buck Rogers, any of the Buck Rogers? Buck Rogers, yeah. Yeah, so he, okay, that's cool. Yeah, it's nice to know, because I think everyone assumes that the artists of that era watch that stuff, but it's nice to know that that there's a recognition for that you were mentioning that your dad would take you on construction jobs yeah but if steve ditko was like reading or studying or doing work he wouldn't be taken to these construction jobs because there was some sort of value that that education was an important thing did i read that correctly from that jashanic book i just thought it was unusual that steve would have been older and not to you know degrade child youth but like he would have been more helpful because he was older he was bigger he was taller he was stronger that he could have been more helpful but instead of taking steve he took you why do you think that would be can't say he liked me more (laughs) (laughs) you could say that i don't know if it would be true Uh, i know i well i know one thing i had an interest in construction there you go yeah so you expressed an interest yeah so and did steve not really like that stuff you know what do you think that Uncle Steve had a hard time working with Pop? That could be. That could okay, be. so maybe not as close to his dad too. Pop, he was, he was, he wanted things his way. <laughs> I see. You know. So even though they shared comics as a as a similar hobby, yeah, their personalities were quite different. I, I always say a little bit, yeah. Oh, that's really fascinating. <laughs> and uh, you got along with Pop, Bill? Well, yeah, I. Uh, I got along with everybody. You know? yes. I didn't know because that's better. what the youngest in the families do. I didn't know any better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you remember him having any high school girlfriends or anything like that, Steve? Yeah, yeah. Not really, huh? Did he ever talk about having a crush on anybody? Yeah, never. And he would have been really young for that, though. He would have yeah. been ten years old. Seven, yeah, ten years old. Maybe you're, with, you're not talking maybe, to your little brother about right, that. Right. Maybe with my sisters, but I, I doubt it very much. Yeah, it would have been Auntie Annie that would have been the because yeah. she was a couple years older than. There you her. go. So he could so, kind of talk to her about stuff. Yeah. Did Did he ever talk about dating or having girlfriends ever? Yep. Yeah, even as an adult. What's your impression? Why do you think that is? I don't know. I have no idea why. Mm-hmm. And then he never got married. He never had kids. Nope. But he loved kids. I've seen your home videos, and he's playing with you know his nephews, nieces, oh, yeah, yeah. and he's loving the kids. He's loving these family get-togethers like very regularly. That was his time away from New York, is hanging out with you guys. So uh, it's interesting that he didn't get married and have kids. See, I, I can I relate think, to that. I think his career meant more to him. And that's what I would agree with. Yeah, yeah the yeah. work. I would say that he was so dedicated to his profession. Without a doubt. You know. And, yeah. And he didn't want to ever be pulled from it in any way. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's something that separates success from greatness is yeah. that you can be successful and you can get married, have kids and have a good yeah, job. Yeah. That's success. Yeah, yeah. But that's not necessarily achieving greatness in, in, an, in, in, in an revolutionizing industry. and absolutely yeah, yeah. changing an industry yeah. completely. Yeah, that's I true. think that's, that takes a, a different level of commitment. And I think you would be hard pressed to not you know, see the evidence that he was intentionally doing. Yeah, yeah. He dabbled in everything. Anything that he touched, he kind of had the, almost a Midas touch of uh, uh, in the comic book industry of changing Iron Man's, you know, costume yeah, of you right. know the the logistics of yeah. the Hulk, right. you know, yeah. just so many things that he revolutionized. Yeah. You can't think that it was luck. Yeah. And in my book, I read that he was the great problem solver. When these characters didn't work, he could make them work. Uh, yeah. yeah. Because he could tell what was missing. He could see in that fifth dimension that other people couldn't see. This has to be real for this to work. Designs when he was younger. These woodcut blocks he made in shop class. One has webbing, which is interesting. And one almost has like a a Doctor Strange almost look to it. So let's 
can you can you show us those? Um, this one has the webbing on it, okay? Yeah. And that I find interesting, especially with the candle and whatnot. But the webbing is just so distinctly Steve Ditko webbing, yeah. and uh, so I think that's like really fascinating. And then this and character, and that's 1946, <laughs> and this is 1946 webbing that he did. And then this is like a sorcerer with a yes. with a cloak. But then there's also these eyes, but then this figure with almost it looks like um, this Doctor Strange type cape and figure mixed with these eyes. And you see a little um, bird in the, in the eye there too. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. kinds of different so it's like, it's like two images on uh, in one, but this almost has that Doctor Strange look. So it's interesting that, that a Spider-Man and Doctor Strange precursor would exist in 1946. I just find that so interesting. So after high school and he served in world war ii this was after the atom bomb and this was three years he served from what i understand from 1945 to 1948 he signed up for it so it sounds like there's a certain patriotism in him serving is that was that right is patriotism the right word for that yes when world war ii ended though he traveled all through post-war germany and kind of looked at europe and after world war ii and he was out there for a few years and he sent a lot of letters and there's a lot of photos from that era, is that Albums. Correct? That was all of when he was in the service. I tell you, he has, I can't believe how many photos he has and then how he has them. Organized. Yeah. Uh, the organization of them is a well, mammoth. And the organization, too, a lot of the pictures have different vantage points and yeah. different angles. And the way he lays them out on the page and details it, it is very comic book-like in its structure. And it's almost like he's exploring the way of documenting a story or documenting something and how to convey ideas. And you could see all of that storytelling starting to form at that very early age when he was in the, in the service. Uh, Patrick, you mentioned something interesting that he never flew on a plane, like not even once. We had some, uh, uh, Bob Jashonik did some research for us. His squadron for the constabulatory was shipped they took a ship over yeah. there. Yeah, he was shipped out. Yeah, he was literally shipped out and shipped back. <laughs> so And so he never got he on a plane. He never and, set uh, foot yeah. on a plane. Yeah. And as we had mentioned, for someone that did science fiction and stories about spacecraft, to have yeah. never actually traveled in the air yeah. is pretty interesting. That is interesting, yes. And he didn't drive either. No, he yeah. did not have a driver's license. He had a state ID. And when he came to Johnstown, he came by train. Yeah, it was train and then maybe subway in New York. So he never went abroad to Europe again. That was those, those three years. But it also sounds like it was a lot of visual inspiration for him from those photographs yep. that I was looking at, that he was playing with photography and angles and things while soaking in a lot of the interesting experiences and culture there. So, Well, so, and it also with the photography too, it was yeah. interesting even having that camera and having all those pictures. He never took another picture after that. Though. Yeah. He never used that camera anymore. Yeah. There was never any other. It was, you know. It was like he was done. He did it. He yeah. had his experience with photography and was. And that was it after that. Maybe it was because I had his camera. <laughs> you have that camera I here? Do. Yeah. I know this has something to do with it. There it is. So this is the camera he was using. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a Kodak. It's got a great it's a the Kodak, lo- yeah. look at that logo. Oh yeah, that's not the Kodak yeah. logo that we're familiar with. What's this? That coverage part. Oh. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then this is the front, and it comes out after the service. He was in the Veterans Trade School here in Johnstown. Yes. From 1948 to 1950, and so were you hanging out with him during that period of time? Not other than family wise. Did he ever bring any of the stuff he was drawing home? No. Not really, right? And then I guess, from what I understand, the GI Bill gave him money to do these kind of schools. Is that right? That's what I understand, too. Now, this is the period of time where he was like dressed like Ahab and Dracula was during the Veterans Trade School. You believe that's right, right? It wasn't before that. It couldn't have been after. No, yeah. It had to be it. at that time. Yeah. yeah, so then when he was experimenting with like different genres of characters, he was taking photos of himself dressed like an Arab and dressed like these different figures. Yeah. A little bit during Absolutely. that. That might have been when he was exercising 
that artistically? Well, he had done Europe in the service, yeah. and if he's broadening his worldview, yeah. that would be the t- next step. Would be the Middle East, yeah, that's right? right? Yeah, totally. So it seems like a it seems like a logical progression. Yeah, uh, but not enough to get on an airplane, though. Not <laughs> enough. No Pan Am tickets for that. Uh-huh. One. Now, weren't there also interesting photos of him like climbing walls and stuff? Like that one was from the service. Yeah, the service. they were playing baseball, and the ball got stuck up on the balcony, uh-huh. and he was the one to climb up. And, and he was and doing the wall it. crawling in that, and it because because it just looked like a wall crawling uh, that he would draw later. That's what was funny about that. And it's him though, so he didn't take the picture either. Yeah, he yeah. was doing the crawling. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. He actually was the crawler. But that was the know, only way he was going to get that shot. He yeah. couldn't explain it to someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and it seemed like there's a lot of, you know, learning angles and visual angles, which I think he implements later on. Cartoonist and illustrator school from 1950 to 53. He trained under, well, Jerry Robinson was one of his teachers there. And he's kind of learning how to tell stories. But he came back and visited here, even though the, during that period, right? Like they were, they weren't in session all the time. He'd come back and visit. For the holidays. The holidays, yeah. That's all he'd come back for. I mean... He never talked about it. And he never talked about the cartoonist and illustrator school, right? Or the people he saw there or any of that stuff? Uh, my mother might have known, but none of, nobody else did. After that, then it's 1953. I think he's starting to work at Charlton at this point. And Charlton, they were based out in Connecticut. And so he would drive there. Turns out I, I'd read in the Jashanic book, he'd hang out there for a whole weekend sometimes. But he didn't drive there. No, he, he took, took a the train. train. Took a train. So he took the train to Connecticut and back. And then he'd take the train here. So these are kind of like these different. And it almost seemed like it's like another life he was having when he was going to like hanging out there for a weekend and talking to different people and being a regular at the Charlton place. Uh, he would have his own experiences there and not and not necessarily connect it with the experiences here. Right. For sure. I would say yes. Creative freedom. It seems like one of the things at Charlton when he was making a lot of stories with Joe Gill is they didn't have too much editorial interference and so he was free to do a lot of what he wanted to do visual experimentation telling different stories he felt like telling is creative freedom is that just an overall theme in his life and is that something that you feel was important to him just in general well yes absolutely tell me about that like why is that so absolutely true well, this guy did it himself in the architecture practice. Yeah, he was worked as a draftsman. He studied, he apprenticed, he took his test. He was working with some partners, and then he decided to go out on his own so he could do his own thing. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't like what they were doing. Yeah, you know, yeah. and, uh, uh-huh. I worked for 16 years yeah. under architects, and I, I, I never found one that I liked yeah. to be a partner or something. Yeah. And I had no aspirations of ever becoming an architect but when i did i i just did a lot of different things that i always wanted to do to make the job better basically mm-hmm. and uh, i loved solving puzzles mm-hmm. and every job was a puzzle yeah when you meet the client you know let's say i want this i want this i want that and i would say well it all depends number one on the code and number two, it might not work. Yeah. So. So then this sounds like there's like similar, although you guys had different jobs, it seems like there's a similar mindset that that creative freedom enabled you to solve problems. You know, I had a problem one day when he, when he came here. And, uh, he, he says, oh, yeah. we were talking and I said, you know, I got a problem. I can't make this thing to work, something to work. And I don't even remember what it was. But he wrote me a letter and he says, if something's not working, he says, flop it, turn it around, and keep moving it around and doing different things to it, and and you'll find a solution. And that's what I did. Mm. That's what I always do. Mm. I got to figure out, you know, hey. (laughs) What do we do? That's all we do. And that's, that's the thing about when you're a creative person and you work through a creative process, I think one of the problems that creative people have with criticism is that oftentimes the critic hasn't worked through the process and hasn't seen the other variations. So I've done some design work and I've done creative positions where I've had to work with a client and 
you know, work through their feedback. And it's like your feedback is sometimes often from the gut and it's based on a, a knee jerk reaction. I've already passed that. Like what you're thinking that you need to see, I've already seen it. I'm five or six or seven or eight iterations later than that. And I got here by doing those iterations. So for you to come in and say, well, why don't you do this? Well, I did that and I found out why that doesn't work. And I found out why this doesn't work. And now that's how I got mm -hmm. to, to the solution. Yeah, right. When he talked about solving problems and, you know, when you come up with a solution to a problem, you usually had to go through a certain amount of means and tests and trials and errors to get there. So when somebody comes and says, well, why did you do it? Why didn't you do this? Yeah. There's yeah. usually a reason for it that they're not seeing. Yeah. yeah. So then, and that's great because the fact that he relayed that advice means that that is, that he consciously knew that he was doing those things and solving those problems. Yeah. In the, in the comic world, because when things didn't work, he made them work, or he would create something and that would work. And that's great that that became advice for you and your work and that you guys share that. So you can kind of relate to that. And the creative freedom seems to be the necessary ingredient for that, to, for that to be able to happen unimpeded, right? Tuberculosis. Uh -huh. Yeah, so he had, I guess, two bouts of it. Were you there during the, the, the bouts of tuberculosis he had? Yes. Yeah, so during the first one, that was like in the kind of later 50s, I mean, what do you remember of that, of that period of time? The only thing I remember is I never knew he had tuberculosis. That's all I can tell you. Because okay. my mother went to New York to get him, I think, for the first time or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And he came back and he, he lived a, a normal life at home and... I never saw any difference in him. Okay, that's he what I wanted not to. Aware of. That's what I wanted to find out was was he in bed and just sick and feverish for like a year? No. You know, was he scarred by this culturally? His whole body language changing after? Did he get scarred personally? I didn't recognize any change in him from what I knew. Okay, that's cool. I like that because some people erroneously say that that's why he became you know, isolation, isolated. It's just like so silly. So it's nice to get that. Yeah, no, that doesn't even jive. Because even when I like did the publishing schedule, you could see there was nothing published in 1956. So he was here yeah. in 56. That was the year he was married. Yeah. So that's another reason yeah. it wasn't, he was planning his wedding. You know, he yeah. was at a definitely at a different point in his life. But from the, we've talked about this because people keep wanting to dig into this yeah, so yeah. i'll dig into it and too to further with them and i'll say but dad so dad you really don't remember that you don't you know so it wasn't it wasn't like this big catastrophic home, thing but it wasn't like he came home and ever and his mom said steve's home with tuberculosis you yeah. know it wasn't a family announcement it was probably kept pretty quiet i yeah. would say and especially with him getting married that year yeah so oh we don't you know we're not Didn't gonna bring everybody down either. with yeah. you know when the, there should be a happy, this should be a happy yeah, occasion. That, that's good. And that's a selflessness on his yeah. part. Like, it's not about him being sick. He right? was at my wedding yeah. with uh, a, a neighbor, uh, Freddie Coleman. Mm -hmm. Freddie Coleman and him, uh, Steve, come up to me and says, come on with us, Pat. So this was at the reception down at St. Mary's. So I said, oh, okay. So I went and they took me over to the bar. And they says, "Well, you should. You've got to have a drink. You got. You're get. You're married. This and that." And uh, so I had a drink first and last drink I had, mm. and my brother had a drink, and he he didn't drink either. Yeah. But <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Yeah, because your brother didn't drink, right? Yeah. Yeah, Steve never drank alcohol. Yeah. Did he ever discuss his discovery of Ayn Rand? with you at all any of the Ayn Randianism no. that never really came up no. the only thing that we have in common there is uh I watch that uh what's the name Fountainhead Fountainhead all the time oh you do that's cool every time it's on I watch it oh okay um yeah he has a VHS of the Fountainhead that you guys found in his place so he, you guys both like that yeah. what, what is it about the Fountainhead that you like 
I liked the whole story. I just yeah. liked the whole thing. I yeah. thought it was really good. The whole concept. Yeah. Of it. And uh, did he ever talk about the Fountainhead with you? No. Yeah, but you both like it kind of in this yeah, really interesting... Separately, yeah. Separately, though, you guys like it. So you don't feel like when he started getting into the, the Ayn Rand kind of thought process that he changed family-wise? Like when he came, he was still the same jovial no, was, brother and uncle. I didn't notice anything if it did. Mm -hmm. you know. Do you know if he voted? Did he ever vote? I'm sure he did. Okay, because he was pretty. Would he ever talk about politics at all with you? No, but what? I'm sure he did because that and uh, you know he, if there's any kind of veterans or anything else, he uh, supported all of them. Okay, so he was all about the pro-veteran. Yeah, he. Uh, I sent him contributions all the time. My brother Mark did write him about voting. Yeah, and he actually said, "No." Yeah. Yeah, that's what Mark had mentioned. Yeah. But I was wondering if he had ever talked about that in the house. No, I think politics were, uh, in a similar way that New York was off the table, politics were generally off it's the table. Really we did a, not grow really up in a heated thing. political environment. Yeah, yeah, right. It was not. It was more about family than that. You guys found um, what I thought was really cool were like movies that he watched. Can you show us some of those? Like we got like a. The tall yeah, man. Like a Clark Gable Western. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then what else was he watching Same. from Russia with Love? So James. So it looks like Sean Connery was his preferred James Bond. Based on yeah, our current based evidence. On this. Another yeah. Clark Gable. Yeah. Another Clark Gable film betrayed. So he liked Clark Gable. It's interesting to see yeah. the characters, he, the people he liked. Yeah. And then especially always reinforcing the fact that Steve Ditko was funny. Yeah. Abbott he did Cust love oh, his Abbott yeah. and Costello. He had a couple of Abbott and Costello movies. These are, this is his own. Movie collection, VHS collection. And I personally like Abbott and Costello better than the Three Stooges yeah. and better than Laurel. Same Hyde. here. Yeah. So I thought they were the. Uh, Richard Burton, Clint yeah. Eastwood, yeah. Where Eagles Dare. Yeah, so he, he watched Clint Eastwood. That's cool. And Charles then, Bronson. Charles Bronson, who was also uh, uh, born in Pennsylvania. Yeah, about a half like an hour away. South Fork. Uh, so South Fork. From here. And like Johnny Weismuller is from here. Charles Bronson also from here. And so he found those guys interesting. That's great. And then The Mark of Zorro with Douglas oh. Fairbanks, which is a big deal because so many comic creators watched that back then. That's cool that he had that. And then The Big Sleep. So he was Bogart? a fan of detective noir films. Another Bogart. Yeah, another Bogart, Dead Reckoning. Uh huh. Big Country? Yeah, Big Country, which is a, oh, that's a, a Western with Gregory Peck. Burt Lancaster, yeah, Vengeance. Burt Lancaster, uh, uh, that uh, is my guy. Oh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Magnificent Seven, the of Magnificent course. Seven. So he had this, his VHS, oh. The Magnificent Seven. Uh -huh. And then as previously. That's uh, right. That's the Fountainhead. And that's his like kind of bootleg copy of the uh, of it on VHS. I wonder if somebody burned Probably, it. I think they recorded, recorded it for, recorded him. for him. Yeah. I feel like um, maybe more Todd may, maybe mentioned that. When I uh, when I interviewed him, that they that they were watching Fountainhead together. There's an entire great courses uh, DVD and yeah. books. The Nature of Earth, a geology book. So it's like a self-taught guy that just kind of read a lot of his own stuff. Psychopistemology. Psycho right? And this is the uh, like an Ayn Rand. Revolutionary theory: the science of psychoepistemology. He had many magazine subscriptions. He yes. had National Geographic, um, yes. uh, Time. He even had two it's subscriptions two. to Time. Mm -hmm. And we think that the reason being is that if he was pulling out an article for reference and they were back to back, mm -hmm. and he needed two, mm -hmm. he needed two copies so mm -hmm. that each file could have its complete yeah. pages. Right. Really bizarre. So, of course, they'd have some Egypt going on uh -huh. there. Yeah. Uh, props out to ancient, ancient aliens. aliens. All right. And he drew ancient aliens in Charlton science fiction comics, too. And, you know, what, what collection yeah. would not be complete Greek, uh, without his, his, yeah, his classicism? Yep. Classicism, yeah. And then... Yeah, because he was talking a lot about the Aristotle kind of stuff, too. Little, An and little Lansbury. <laughs> little Lansbury. Well, who sure. knew that Steve Ditko was a fan of... Yeah, but who isn't? Well, who isn't a fan of Angela? She was Lambert. a hottie in her day. Yeah, she was. She was. And then music for those that have all been curious. Yeah, you can so tell you like that he, he liked a, some Dean Martin. He was a Dean Martin fan. Okay. Yeah, I like it. 
and, and Glenn then, Miller. Glenn Miller, yeah. So this was his DVD player. Even though it looks like an old radio, it is yeah. a DVD, yeah. but it definitely gives a, a, a good likens to his uh, his taste yeah, and his really nostalgia. Yeah, the nostalgia for the 50s in yeah. um, this DVD player. The, you know what's really fun about the way this shot is framed? This It looks like it's a QVC like little <laughs> commercial. Like going for 50 bucks, 1-800-STEVE-DITCO, call right away. <laughs> <laughs> and then music not yeah. only did he listen to music yeah. that he sang and these are like the songs yes. that he would sing Here, and uh and this is the booklet right and so this is like the the christmas songs and whatnot yeah we, and, uh, we still have a couple of copies do you want one <laughs> yeah no yeah that, i think i think yeah he gave me one yeah he gave him one already <laughs> And yes, yeah, Santa Claus is coming to town. So you guys would all sing this together as a family then. Oh, Sit around the yeah. table and sing. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And all the nieces and nephews would run away. <laughs> that's how they got rid of us. And then when your voice got bad, we'd play Pina because if we were yeah. still able. Okay, there you go. And you know, we talked about, my dad and I were talking about this stuff getting ready. And, and when we'd he'd come in for Christmas and he had a set holiday schedule of who was like, what house was going to host yeah, him what right, day right, kind right. of. And his sister Betty hosted Christmas day every year. Um, so that's when the songs would have been sung. So Patrick was showing me like his diagrams of human behavior and group thinking. And he had diagrams of, of the different like, what patriotism means, communism, uh, socialism, you know, anarchism. And so, and this, these are his folders, yeah. but he would have these diagrams that a lot of it, some of it would make it into his Mr. A comics, but it was also like his, um, his own, you know, interesting way, property, intellectual property, intangible property. This is all his power of moral idealism yeah the power of moral idealism and the way he has these lines and circles around the words like it makes it come alive in this really interesting sort of way and then just show them um just the folder even like he would have folders yeah. that he would label this was as patrick said earlier his hard drive was <laughs> was that this is his you know the aspects yeah. of man we had four you know, boxes the now. models of man you know, and then political context, and they would have magazine articles ripped out. Um, and uh, just just really interesting, just politics, politics, politics. So it was like, and it was like theory, it was like political theory that he was, it wasn't necessarily like, oh, I'm going to vote this mayor out because, you know, there is urine on the ground. It's more because it was more theoretical kind of things and that's just so interesting and a shout out to joe frank for providing all these wonderful that's envelopes right. <laughs> these letters right. came from joe frank that's right hundreds of manila envelopes courtesy of joe they, that's, that's... they didn't go to waste <laughs> they, they didn't, didn't he waste. didn't waste anything they didn't go to yeah. waste. there were also notes on the back of mcdonald's placements yeah one of the editors at marvel mentioned in the jashanic book that ditko would mention the evils of the united nations now did he ever bring talk about that with you at all? Okay, that's interesting. I, I just find these random quotes just fascinating. For the auction that you guys did, there's that video of Steve Ditko being, you know, funny and theatrical and acting in front of the camera. When we were looking at that footage earlier, you were saying that he was kind of a nut, real spontaneous. Um, was he like that? Was he playful, creatively playful oh, like yeah, that? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Uh -huh. He was very animated with his body too. It wasn't just yes. It wasn't just what he drew. He was animated himself. He lived um, the part. He lived the part. Yeah. And so, is that a sign of him like really feeling what he's uh, trying to express and like making it more alive for him? Uh, what, what, what do you think that he was doing there? Oh, boy, I wouldn't know with him. Yeah, yeah. And so there was a certain spontaneity that he had that was almost like in your case. You feel like it was almost like that was him. That was a very uniquely Steve Ditko. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> when he would stage oh, these kind of geez. events, he would come in and there yeah. would be, we'd have these photographs. And this is interesting because, especially, you know, where he has the eyes and he's posing um, on his shirt and then the different like forehands, you know, doing these optical kind of illusion with other people, uh, forehanded, you know, 
kind of imagery. This is all kind of very Doctor Strange kind of so this, visuals. Yeah, how that's did, him. When he would come and visit, how did he get, how did he pull something like this off? Like, how did you go, how did you get from, hey, Uncle Steve's here, to let's stand and put arms around each other and hold skulls and take pictures? Like, I've always wondered, how did you get to that point? How did he initiate that kind of stuff? You know, there was so much crazy stuff going on. And I think, uh, no, I don't know. And and we took pictures of it. That's what the yeah, It was amazing. very staged. I mean, you didn't, yeah. you know, this isn't spontaneous. Oh, this isn't like. Yeah. He thought about it. Yeah. This is organized. Yeah, he wanted to compose something here. And he involved everybody. He, he was involving he his sister. He, he was involving my mom. Yeah. He wanted everybody to participate. Yeah. He wanted everybody yeah. to have a good time and laugh yeah. and enjoy the experience. Yeah. So it was much more than much more than just an exploration for his next comic yeah. book, too. Yeah. Because yeah. it was a way of involving people and having yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah, having fun. That's right. Having a good time. And doing like unique stuff too. It's not like the neighbors are doing that stuff. No. <laughs> of course, there's a video you showed me of him, like, kind of dressed as a baby in the baby's crib. And, and his humor work from here to insanity to cracked. It seemed like he was a funny guy. He was. Oh, yeah. Made a lot of jokes. Oh. Uh, what, what were kind of impersonations? What, what were some of the funny things he was doing? He'd do things like when he's making babalki, he would count them. I mean, that wasn't funny, but it was. To us, it was funny. Why would anybody want to count, count all the balls? It's a traditional Slovak dish that's made with tiny bread balls. Yeah. Each one is rolled and placed into a pan and then baked and broken apart. So there's probably, you know, 120 balls on a sheet. Yeah. And he'd do, he had notes. My cousin found a notebook, didn't yeah. keep it, unfortunately. This year, the dough didn't rise very well. Um, <laughs> We only yielded 896 oh, Bobolki yeah, balls. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah it was like was a, there was a, but there was also a sarcasm too. There's a humor there, though. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's a humor that's kind of yeah, unique. I mean, I know we had a ball. So we do have the guy. pictures of him baking. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, and that's so, and the, the baking the there. Uh -huh. Takeaway clip from that whole segment would be you know, he would come back and bake. Yeah. I He's mean, a family dude. People don't think of, you know, this inaccurate portrayal of him as a recluse and, yeah. you know he was a pretty regular guy and right. he liked regular things he liked hanging out with family he liked bacon he worked worked the grill you know he wasn't yeah it wasn't like he was above anything right. and he came from new york and everybody was like oh steve's here and, yeah you know yeah we rolled out the red carpet and yeah everybody was glad to see him and they enjoyed that time but it was because he was a fun guy and that he participated yeah, you mentioned it earlier that there there would be a lot of joking around with him, but there was always a sense of being careful with pushing it too far with him. Is that right? You didn't want to you didn't want to unnerve him or insult him. I would say you watch yourself. Yeah. Why Why is that? You think? Well, just because I don't think you want to say anything that would get into confrontation about something. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't any one of my family's not like that. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't think he was so. Non-confrontational. Yeah. Nobody was pushing buttons, no, yeah. trying to get a reaction. All we, was doing, we were all together and we were having a good time. That's all the comedy. That's what it was about. Yeah. Nobody was going to come and say, hey, Steve, how's Stan doing these days? Yeah, boy, that, that was like be... not going to happen in this household. Yeah, right. That makes sense. And, and there would be no reason to do that. Did you ever talk about Eric Stanton or did you ever meet him? No. Nope. No, but you know about Eric Stanton, though. Well... Yeah, after a while, I've learned. So you learned about him after. Yeah. And over just with even the both of us, just over the last few Only years. the last few years. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, Eric Stanton had some Eastern European background, too, of some kind. Okay, yes. So is it possible that, although they, they both shared a studio for like 10 years, possibly dated together, is it possible that there could have been also just a shared Eastern European feeling toward with one another? I wouldn't Does, be surprised. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I believe... Either that after Eric Stanton, he went solo, right? Yeah. His studio after right. that, he didn't want to share a studio yeah, with sure. anybody yeah. else after that. Yeah. And I think after Stanton got married and he, that was kind of it after, as far as uh, two wild and crazy guys. I also think that when my mom and dad went to visit him and he opened the door and yeah. then he's closing it behind him. I think that would have been Stanton's studio. Yeah. 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 Right. Stanton's studio. Oh, what year was that when you did that? 
Oh, okay. Six, six seven, seven, eight. Was in the no. late 50s when you did that? No, or was it later? It was than later that? than that. Not, not much, though. We were in the car. No, it wasn't much later. So it was like late 50s, early 60s? It right? would have been the Stanton studio okay, for sure. Okay, so yeah, yeah. 100%. That's right. Yeah, because oh. Stanton was in there. Yeah. yeah. So that was, oh, oh, my okay. brother's here. Yeah. Let's go out and have Let's some coffee. That. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I, so who knows what was going on? I thought there. it was funny, and, and Joan always says we should have asked him if we can go in there. Yeah, yeah and yeah. my wife no, would say go. that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, because there was some interesting uh, art during that Stanton period um, that you guys have probably seen. Yeah. So then, when did you first find out that Spider-Man and Doctor Strange were his? Well, that's a good question. I've never heard you ask that. You've never been asked that question. No, I never have been. Was that in the 60s, like while he was doing it, or was it more when he was done with it, you think? Well, he sent me comics of it. Okay, so he sent you comics of it. Early. Yeah. yeah. You don't remember one or two or three or four or what story it was? Do you remember if the goblin, Green Goblin was in it? Do you have any, any recollection of what the story might have been? No, I don't. And so this was possibly in the early 60s while he was doing it. Yeah. Was he also sending you the other stuff like Conga and Gorgo and any of those things, or was it more the Spider Man you think? More of Spider Man. Okay, that's interesting. So it sounds like, do you feel like he was especially proud of that character? Oh, absolutely. Did he ever mention anything specific about that? No, but uh, my cousin, uh, Helen uh, Dure, she was a. Uh, a cousin to Steve too. Yeah. She uh she always says when we meet her, she'd say, uh, how's how's Junik doing or something, you know, and it's oh well he's doing all right, this and that. Well, you know what? He's the one that created Spider Man, not that Stan Lee. She'd go off on a tangent. And <laughs> I, where she got it from, I have no idea. I see. But it's possible that Steve may have told her that at the time. Or oh, whatever. there's something, yeah, or, yeah, who knows? I, I don't know. Huh. But it was. But there was a feeling when he did first see it that Peter Parker was more like Steve Ditko. Oh, I, I, and then, I said that as soon as I read it. And then there was something from the cousin that it was a, more of a Steve Ditko yeah. type of creation. She, she says that she remembers him doing that when he was home, yeah. and I don't remember. Oh, when he was here, he was actually kind of working on it a little yeah. bit. I see. So this was kind of an innocent time for him, kind of early 60s where he's doing stuff. He may have done stuff here, but um, he wasn't as maybe hardened to the situation maybe as he was later. But you never talked about it with him directly, Spider-Man. Yeah. yeah. And then did he ever talk about Jack Kirby, Marvel, Wallywood, anything in person with you? No. Did he ever talk about Joe Gill at Charlton, the, the guy at Charlton? No, right? Everything that happened in New York, Stayed I was not pretty aware too. of. Right. But the interesting thing is that he sent you some Spider-Man comics in the early 60s. That's just really interesting. Well, Because that seems to break that rule a little. Wait, well, I don't know when it was, but he used to send me uh, comic books, and then he sent me those albums. But this, no. That was much later. I mean, yeah, but prior to that, he would send me, I have boxes of stuff that he sent me. And uh, like his certificates, his um, discharge. That was all 2017, oh, 2016, okay. 17, 18. It was much later. I don't know where my days are. but it, you, you are pretty sure, though, that he had sent you copies of early Spider-Man. I would say. Where yeah. did he send them to you? Here. So it had to be after 60. Yeah, they bought it in 60, so he, yeah. that would have been later 60s. It would yeah. have been this address that he yeah. would have. Because there's a feeling like you've known that he was doing Spider-Man for a long time. This isn't like a recent thing. Like you knew for a long time that he had done Spider-Man. Yeah. On the Mary Marvel Marching Society record that Marvel put out in the mid-60s, they called him, you know, shy Steve Ditko. Is that not the right word to use for him? And that's not the right word at all. yeah. It, was it just more like if he was interested in talking to a person, he would, and if he wasn't, he wouldn't? Is that I how think, that was? Um, shy doesn't sound too bad. Mm. I think with some people, he may be, be that way. Mm -hmm. But with people he knew, no, no way. So I don't know how you say that. 
Right. Interesting. So it sounds like maybe he had to be, he had to kind of know a person and then, and then he wasn't shy. Context. So maybe like a new person, he wouldn't necessarily go trying to talk to If you go into a group of new people, well, now you're, you're, you're screwed. Then you're probably, he's less interested. And, and on the lighter note of that, we had a Christmas dinner here. Uh, not a Christmas. Uh, Christmas party. Yeah, we had a Christmas party and I invited uh, Jerry Canary and his girlfriend. Yeah. And they came down and Steve was here. And he was so uh, almost rude to them. Mm -hmm. Because he says, I thought this was a family get together. Okay. Like he didn't talk to him. No, he didn't want to have anything to do with him. Uh, and then yeah. that sort of set the tone that, that you didn't invite friends yeah. to the family gatherings yeah. that he was going to be at. I see. Family you only. Had a, that, that was. You wanted yeah. to have a gathering. Go ahead. Yeah. But I, I'm not going to be there. Yeah, if yeah. It's going to be friends and family. Yes, it had to be family. Fact yeah. is, mom was like sort of upset about that, and, but. Never, never went any further. Than that. Yeah, I see. Yeah. What What year was that story? Well, it had to be a. I don't know. Like seventies. Yeah, it had to be around yeah. seventy two. Nineteen seventy two. Yeah, yeah, I got registered in seventy two, right? Isn't that the... a little later than that? Because seventy six was. Oh, uh, uh, seventy six was the yeah. Christ the Savior. It could so have been Jerry around seventy six then. I see. Um, because Jerry was a partner up there, and I invited him down here. Ditko wrote that he left Spider-Man and Doctor Strange behind and went off to Charlton. He had expressed what he wanted to express. He wanted to express the next project, work on the next thing. But there was some implication he made that the breakdown in communication made him less motivated to stay. What's your impression of that breakdown in communication? If there is, why is that an important factor? For him to stay involved in something. Well, I mean, I, first of all, how would you feel comfortable with working with somebody that doesn't respond to you? Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. There you go. Uh huh. And uh, I, I'd probably do the same thing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But um, you got to have feedback if you're going to do anything. What's your impression of Stanley? The I, I my impression of him. Because I know so much about him now that uh, I would call him a leech. Okay, there you go. Because I think that's what he is. Yeah. I'm right or wrong. <laughs> right, right. But that that's my... that's your impression. Yeah. And that's fair, you know, yeah. and that's fair. Um, and it's hard to tell if Steve felt that specific term also, or do you feel like Steve probably thought that too? Well, if he's anything like I am, he would probably think similar. Yeah. You know, you In know, he's direction. thinking he's I'm his meal ticket, basically. And mm. Bethany Swarovski, who looked into some of these religious icons, uh, had made some sort of similarity or drew a similarity between the Byzantine Catholic saint hand gestures. And then the um, Doctor Strange hand gestures, the Spider-Man hand gestures. Do you think there's anything to that based on what you've seen? When did the Iconostas come out? In or it never Saint Mary's never had an Iconostas in the old church. Saint no, Mary's. there was never an icon in that church. Saint Mary's never had icons. Never had a okay Iconostas. Then you could I would can all of this, and I'll because, tell you why. Yeah. Because. St. Mary's didn't have a traditional iconostas. It didn't have traditional icons. It had a Roman feel. Yeah. So those icons with those hand gestures were most likely not present. Yeah. And then even more specifically, my friend Ashley studied uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And the Doctor Strange mudras are all legit. Yeah. They are mudras from Buddhism. All the... Buddha's in go. the in, so it's more of an Eastern influence, probably. Those I took non-Eastern art history yeah, yeah, yeah. and studied those Buddhas. Yeah, yeah. Those there's like seven or yeah. eight different hand that are yeah. very but they are that way. And he used those hand gestures for Doctor Strange. She spotted them in the movie. Okay. She called her Tibetan monk friend and yeah. was like, 
Those are the right, those are the right mudras. Okay, here so go. those hand gestures are 100% extracted from, from legitimate Eastern, Eastern, Eastern hand there gestures. Yeah. And then... Like Buddhist, in the Buddhist world. Yeah, yeah and in the window of Doctor Strange uh, in the house, I do know that there's a Tibetan symbol there. It's yeah. probably more Eastern, which is what Doctor Strange was. He went to Tibet Absolutely. and did all that stuff, right? It's not okay. Byzantine. There we go. And that's cool. And that's great. I love that. When he came back to Marvel in the later, in like 79 or so, he was doing like a Captain Universe and other characters like that. But he did not want to in any way redraw Spider-Man or Doctor Strange ever again. What would be your impression of why he wouldn't want to return to those characters coming back to there? Do you think it's like painful? Do you think it's because those were his kind of, what, what do you think happened there? And you know that he was offered an a extremely huge sum of money to do a graphic novel with Stan Lee, and he turned it down even after that. Yeah. So uh, yeah. it's almost like yeah. taking your baby and then saying, that's not my kid anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's maybe a little extreme, but it's not. Yeah. I think he probably expo he explored those characters to a point that he was satisfied. Okay, that's a good way to put it. Because mm -hmm. um, it wasn't really about making a million dollars in one day like that for him. It was just he wanted to express what he wanted to express. And if, if there was a job and there was an interest. And I was telling you about looking through those covers and what I would see as I would flip through them, it's like, let's make Spider-Man flat. Let's make Spider-Man inverse. Let's make Spider-Man in this position yeah. because we haven't seen him do right. that before. Right. And from what my understanding is that he was usually three issues ahead yeah. from what was being published mm -hmm. in terms of his own personal mm -hmm. creative arc. Mm -hmm. So he was already like, he knew what he was going to do in these episodes and he was already laying, probably laying out ideas for what he would want to do. That was an interesting exploration for him yeah. in the next episode, right. in the next issue. Chameleon, Mr. A, que the question these are kind of these faceless characters that he tend to kind of go back to. And there's something from when he would make, when he would design Squirrel Girl or Spider-Man, there's something about the one identity concept that that character has to fit that function. But these characters have almost like a no identity concept to them. And then there he's almost using them to make whoever's encountering them rethink what real is or what this is or what that chameleon he made spider-man second guess is that chameleon or not the question mr a he would make readers question things he wanted to teach things he was almost imparting values to people what do you think it is about these faceless characters and him trying to teach or him trying to confuse but then also maybe make real and then make a lesson out of it what, what do you think is going on with that well, I think it's a total exploration of the character yeah. concept, right? Yeah. It's almost anti-character. Anti -character. So this is everything that a character would be. What is everything a character wouldn't be? Yeah. And then illustrating that and finding ways of how can I show that yeah. in, a, in a unique way. Yeah, because yeah, see, this issue, you guys are speaking of it from two different angles. Is You from his brother, you knew him really well, or at least as well as a younger brother could. And then also as an architect, but then you're also an artist and you design things and you look at it like an artist and you have a certain creative freedom in your life. You're not going to be held down by a thing. You're going to have that freedom and you're going to hash stuff. So you're looking at like an artist too. And so you can almost kind of answer that from a Ditko artist angle. And that's kind of how your impression of those things are. Well, in my work, I explore perspective and, I, and it's through vanishing points and it's literal, but it's also uh, you have a perspective on things and as I like to use multiple vanishing points, it gives me multiple perspectives. I like to view yeah. whatever it is, an idea or a character or a drawing from as many different vantage points as I can. It's like a well-rounded worldview. And I definitely think that Steve, Steve did that as well. Was doing that with those characters. Jack Harris uh, wrote, in, or there's a quote from him from the Jashanic book, a recollection of a Batman tryout concept that Ditko did where he had these sharp fins on his wrists and you know they could kind of cut things and although that didn't pan out in the comics for him to do it seemed like 
that comes up in the Batman movies the later, that it made sense from an engineering perspective that he would have these little bat wings that could actually cut things. And that comes up in the movie decades later. From your perspective, Patrick, what, what do you think that is? That, that's more of him like, find, like looking into that other dimension and seeing what else could possibly work for that character. He looks, explores the potential in everything and what its strongest aspects are. And of course, you know, it being rejected at that time is just more evidence of Steve Ditko being so far ahead of his time. Ahead of his time is what that is. Yeah. In the Harlan Ellison special in the 1980s, he has this like monologue of Mr. A and what Mr. A is. And have you guys heard that? Yeah, I, I have heard that one. Yes. Yeah. So, but it was all about how he kind of rejected the flawed superhero, the superhero with problems that he felt like a superhero should represent an ideal like they did in the 40s, but in like a more real world way and and how a hero has to have principles and not be imperfect. And he kind of let Spider-Man get away with it because he was a teenager. Right. But as an adult, it should be realized as a person with purpose and function. And I think that comes out in his Blue Beetle character, that it's a very well engineered character with principles that meant so much to Steve Ditko. What do you guys think that is? Well, I think it's the greatest potential that comic books have is to teach a valuable lesson. So, you know, why would you, if you, I could understand why demonstrating flaws in a character makes them more human, but we already are human. We already have flaws. We already know that. Doesn't, wouldn't what make what would make a superhero super would be their ability to refrain from those vices and mm -hmm. refrain from those problems mm -hmm. and to hold them as an ideal. Yeah. And almost to me could even go to like sort of those Catholic roots okay. of you need a model, you need a, a okay. model of, of something to you need rules, you need things to mm -hmm. follow, you need standards. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what do you have? If once flaws become acceptable, what's an acceptable level of flaws mm -hmm. so for in order for comic books to function as a model of something good the characters should represent that when you see that he turned down money to do certain things he had a certain code that he lived by what, what's your take on that was did he show signs of, was he always like that since as long as you knew him that he had a certain he just lived by a certain set of values i think that was steve that's the way he was that was him. He held Seriously. himself to the same standards that he held his characters to. So That's in the same way that he wouldn't, he wouldn't draw a flawed character yeah. any more than he would want flaws in himself. Publ some publishers would turn down his mystery material because they wanted entertainment and not lectures. What's your take on that? They want to sell comics. Huh? That's right. It's not going to sell comics. That's a realistic take. Yeah. And it lines up what's it all about, but about the money. He, it sounds to me like he didn't really focus on yesterday or things that happened before. He was always focused on the present and what he's going to do next. Can you relate to that? And, and what do you think was going into that? Uh, to a degree. Uh -huh. um, the future always looks brighter than the present to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, the future is... A, a, to me, is a, d a dream world that hope you hope happens, oh, but that's cool. you have to li live its life, and uh, sometimes it's not that easy. I think that's a, a convenient and, and a good way to move on from your past. Yeah, is to stick to the present and look towards the future. But I think a healthy life, you've got to have a, you know, a some continuity between your your past and your present and your future a healthy life yeah encompasses all three of those aspects in in unity yeah you can't just just you can't toss one of them out yeah patrick when did you first realize that your uncle created co-created spider-man and dr strange how old were you you know i just i remember being in grade school and we had um a spider-man and I, I don't know which one it was some of mid teen late teens maybe a night number 19 or something that was just laying around the house and i remember taking it into like second third grade and being like look because there was no internet 
you know, you couldn't say, go look it up. There was no, you didn't, I didn't, there was nothing, something that I would brag about or talk about because it was hardly ever, there was hardly any ever way to validate it. People would almost go, oh, there's no way, you know, he's just making that up. So, you know, I always, I knew it, but I usually kept it pretty quiet because it wasn't really worth the, the, the argument. You know, mm -hmm. but I would take in an old tattered Spider-Man and be like, look, his name's right there. That's my uncle, you know, mm -hmm. but it didn't, didn't really resonate. Yeah. You know, did you know it as long as you can remember? Yeah. Like, do you remember like a sibling telling you that or is that how that happened? That's how do you, you know, it just kind of ends up uh, in your mind. Yeah. It's just part you, of the. Did you go around telling everyone about that? Like, hey, my brother made that guy. Not really, right? No, in fact, is uh, after a while, when it came out about him being so famous, I'd go to a meeting and I'd say, well, my only, uh, my claim to fame? Yeah, claim to fame is uh, my brother, Steve. That's all I'd say to open up the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody would chuckle. I don't know if they knew it or what. I didn't care. I just, that's my my line. So now, from what I understand, Mark actually sent some of your art to Uncle Steve to look at. And then, did he ever give you feedback on that artwork? He said it was interesting and that he didn't have any room for it, but that he might take it out and look at it occasionally. <laughs> um, I actually thought would find it, and I was actually surprised to not find it. Oh, okay. So it makes me wonder what happened. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> like, I wonder if he passed it on to someone. Was like, it big? It was a poster. Oh, okay. It was a poster. It's like a 24 by 36 24 poster. 24 by 36 yeah, poster. Of transmission. And then I had read that um, when he would give pointers on art, he would draw it on, like, toilet paper or something disposable just so he can teach the, the thing, but so that it couldn't be, like, saved or sold later. What what do you think that's a what do you think that was about? Oh, boy, I you know or tissue I think paper that's or something. being that's a, a slight that's being slightly misunderstood. I, he's talking about bumwad. Oh, we again, we on, should have been we more live prepared. on bumwad. Oh. Uh, I think it's misconception. Mm. It wasn't the fact that uh, in my work when I draw something. I mean, you can overlay. Yeah. And I draw it again, and I throw it away, and then I do another one. So, yeah, so it's not like there's a, another reason behind it. No, to me, it's, it's just, just kind of quick... to develop what you're doing. Yeah. It's but, like yeah, a quick and, communication. So you don't have yeah, to erase. If you're not familiar with that. Like, so uh, my dad taught me this really early, which is a huge, like, way for you to learn. So... With my drawings in particular, but I'd say anybody that's doing anything really good. So say you do a drawing. Say, well, this is my dad's icon. And say Uncle Steve was going to give him some pointers. Yeah. Okay. It's a teaching tool. That's yeah. It. So then you say, well, I think your halo is a little too big. The halo should be here. I see. And then, you know, this hand is should be down here. Right, right. But then, like for my drawings, I'm always working on translucent layers. Yeah. So I'll do a layer on there, and then I put my finished drawing on, and I extract stuff from there. And then I put another layer on, and I figure things out, and then I'm constantly working on those layers. So when my brothers would do drawings, Uncle Steve would come over, he'd get trace paper, and he'd do this. He would analyze their drawings and tell them how to make it better. Okay, that makes sense. So that's how So it's, it's just a teaching tool and a story. That's pretty much it. Yeah. And tissue paper, yeah, that's what you... That's, that's the paper. Yeah. That story of him walking to a comic shop with... Oh, uh, Rick. Yeah, with, a, his, with his nephew, right? Yeah, like Cousin Rick. Yeah. Um, and talking to a, f a few employees in the comic shop, but nobody knew who he was. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think was going on in his uh, mind? And did he go into comic shops much? I mean... I, who would know? So Rick, you know, that's going to be on our panel. That's, yeah, that's the only reason... Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say that's the only reason he's on the panel, but that's the only reason he's on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, you know, because it was... A, it's just such a good example of how, you know, he would do anything for family and yeah. his sister asked him. 
Yeah, yeah. Is, that's cool. Because yeah, that was Rick. Rick was like, I want to go to college. And I'm yeah. sure she tried to like, he says, you know, she was like, oh no, Rick, yeah. you know, just, oh no, it kept, uh -huh. kept, but he was like, yeah. it was one of those, like, I'm holding my breath until I pass out kind of thing. Like, I got to make this happen it, that she finally broke down and asked him to and, do and, it. And he did. Yeah. That was cool. And now, is this a side of the family that calls him JD and all that? Nope. There's another side of it. There's a lot of family. There is. What do you think his favorite food was? But he always stores. went to McDonald's in New York. That's York. right. That's what I was uh, saying is hamburgers, yeah, was, right? Yeah, hamburger. Yeah. Yeah, hamburger was probably like his favorite thing, I right? Because I, I, I think I feel like I've heard three or four stories you know of what? him I, in a hamburger place. Yeah, he went to McDonald's all the time. Because we had all the placemats. Yeah. Because he put notes on placemats. Yeah. So uh, I would say, yeah. Yeah, and McDonald's hamburgers specifically, it sounds like. Yeah, that's what I would say. But I that's what the placemats show. No, it's great. That's just a cool, funny thing. So then, and uh, then a big coffee drinker. Oh, he drank coffee. Oh, yeah. Okay, so he was a coffee guy. Yeah. Okay, that's cool to know, but not alcohol at all. No. He ate a lot of food when he would visit, so he would measure his weight before oh, yeah. and then after, right? Yeah. So he ate a lot when he would visit. He, he enjoyed himself. But he lived to what ninety yeah. ninety one or so. Ninety one. So on McDonald's burgers, I mean, that's pretty good. Oh, I think he had more than that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in this, uh, remember in the studio, he had a full kitchen there. He had a little cooking area there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so he was probably cooking some stuff uh, himself. Maybe. There was not a lot of food in his apartment. Okay. There was his refrigerator thing. was pretty empty. Okay. His studio was across the street yeah, from his yeah, apartment. Right, he right. only had to cross that. Yeah. And there was a, a bagel stand and it was there. right there. Easy to get so to. I'm sure. Especially not much in the fridge. Go get some bagels or something. Let's talk about kind of the after death scenario where you guys went to a studio and apartment right mm -hmm. and something that i remember you had mentioned patrick was that he was i think from what i understand in a hospital more toward the end and he probably left against medical advice he returned home and he would probably rather um die there and not in a hospital is that is that right yeah is it because he just wanted to be in his own space if he was going to go was that kind of the idea with that what do you think i don't think he had anything that you know he was he knew he was i guess sick but uh i don't know i just he just didn't like the hospital and i can understand why yeah he just wanted out of there because uh, my wife went through but anyway uh I just, he wanted to get out of there. He just wanted to get out of there. Yeah. So tell me what you guys saw in his studio. The first thing I would want to point out is that he doesn't, you know, he didn't have a drafting table. He basically drew on a lap board and he drew on his, his desk, mm. but he didn't have anything tilted. Oh, yeah. He had a T-square, so he used a T-square. Um, we have the pens. I think his pens are extremely interesting. They're follow his uh, tradition of using everything till its last breath. They're taped up and mm. just, you can tell ancient. That wasn't something, it wasn't like, let's get a new pen this month. I'm starting a new character. <laughs> that was not something that he would have done. Um, the visuals in his studio, uh, pictures of the Grand Canyon, uh, Horseshoe Bend, a lot of classical um Greek and Roman sculptures for references on the walls. Um, a lot of nature. That was mostly in his apartment. Oh, yeah, um, apartment, yeah. Um, files, there's tons of files. Lots of files, all of his reference files. Um, and very interesting that he kept a separate space of living and working in. I always found that kind of interesting for people that, are so immersed in their work, like especially like he was, to have a separate place to live and a separate place to work, I find unusual. I don't, I don't know, Dad. What do you think about that? Well, I don't know. I, I, you got to get away from it sometimes to you know rejuvenate it to a degree, get your mind working again. I don't know. I, I don't know why he did that too, but uh, that's what he did. So when we went up into his apartment, um, he had a few modern art pieces, a, a George Brock, um, and then 
the rest of the walls were covered with pictures that his sister Anna Marie would send him every year a calendar of flowers and he would tear all the months out and tack them up on the walls and his apartment was covered with those pictures of flowers um his apartment was on the ninth floor yeah and it had two windows that opened up into a light well that basically just looked into a shaft of windows and you would look out that window and you'd look up and there was one little rectangle of light at the top and you look down and there were six air conditioning units in the bottom of the courtyard what did you think dad after you know growing up here and living in pennsylvania and living in the woods when we first stepped foot into uncle steve's apartment what did you think oh brother he is your brother yeah i know that's what i said oh brother why are you living here i uh, it's i couldn't have taken more than one day of that I see. It's uh, just, uh, I don't know. I, I, I didn't like it at all. Uh -huh. Did you feel like it was kind of confining or, or what? I think it was, for him to live like that was like unthinkable. You know, why, why? Because yeah, we always thought he was doing pretty good, I thought. So, I mean, I had no idea how he and the place was in disarray because he was older and he was sick and he was in the hospital. Yeah, he couldn't take care of anything. So it wasn't, I don't, and what my dad's talking about isn't necessarily just that it was dilapidated or uncared no. for. It was that it was such a, like a small space. Yeah. You know, and his apartment. Yeah. And, and to not have any kind of a view, you know, mm. and if you did open the window, all you were going to hear was noisy city. Mm -hmm. you know and i mean for him and where we live up here and yeah, no, opening the windows and hearing yeah. the cricket it's the opposite yeah it's a hundred percent opposite um and i always wondered what you had thought about you know how different his life was in new york versus how he grew up here in pennsylvania in the woods yeah and exactly. open spaces yeah. and nature and being so close Almost to like, it yeah. and with what he had up on the walls you could tell he missed that Mm. Yeah. It seemed as though he was. Yeah, because he had pictures of the outdoors yeah. on the walls. Exactly. And then I guess what of uh, of Arizona places that you were at. Yeah, places that I had visited were on his walls, which we which, never talked. Which you about. never talked. It was just some weird similar connection of some kind. Yep. Do you think he threw away his original art or disposed of it? I know this to be a fact that he uh, used to use his boards and he cut them. Yeah, cut them up and cut stuff on them, because we found some of those somewhere. Uh, it was that's pretty pub public knowledge that he used yeah. his, his yeah. originals for cutting boards. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, I have a couple of letters from some of the guys that he sent stuff to, uh, with a letter confirming that mm -hmm. you know they're from Stephen, mm -hmm. but uh, very few, mm -hmm. very few. Mm -hmm. Now tell us about the pens. Like what? Like these are his pens, basically. So this pencil box <laughs> would have been from Veteran School era, and it confirms that Ditko and Ahab are the same. Oh, look at that! So Ditko, Ahab. Uh -huh. Wow. And then you have the uh, in the Middle East. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a continuation the, of the kind of the camel and the. Ditko Ahab, and this is from the Veteran Trade School. This is like 1948 to 50. Yeah, it just fits that. Uh -huh. It fits the the, yeah. the 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 era. Yeah. So yeah, these would have been his. This is his, the constabulatory, uh -huh. his sergeant oh, yeah. stripes, like his patches and stuff. Yeah. His dog tags. Oh my gosh, look at that. Yeah. Steve Ditko dog tags. Oh yeah. Oh, okay, Ditko Stephen. Yeah, it's interesting, Ditko. But then it's like some of the letters are backward, but then the Ditko isn't. And then what's this one here? Yeah, same thing. Ditko dog tags. I never thought I would have ever yeah, seen that. Those will be on display tomorrow. It's amazing. Yeah, this is my favorite. Oh, wow. Look at this. Talk about, I'm not giving up on that, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so he put this through some use here, and it's taped up here, it looks like. Over and over and over again. Uh, to keep it together, huh? Yeah. And this one is, too, the same way. Just completely taped. I see. 
Look at that. So what do you think when you see when you see this? I'm saying, yeah, uh, I don't know. I probably would never work with pen and ink. <laughs> like that. Yeah. Not with the calligraphy pens. We, yeah, we use technical pens. We use yeah. rapidographs. Not the old fashions. So he was committed to his his medium. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was interesting because it's almost like he had a comfort level with those pens. Yeah. And so he didn't want to let them go and get a new one. Well, so this, there's another story, too, that he came to visit and his suitcase. Oh. He couldn't. The zipper broke on his suitcase. Oh, okay. And he was and leaving. So, and he was leaving to go back to New York. Yeah. And his sister or brother-in-law were like, you know, we'll get you another bag. No. We're not, I'm, I don't want another suitcase. Yeah. Just give me a rope. So he, he wanted that bag. Tied it together with he a row. His, his, yeah. That bag. His suit. It's got to take it, you know, it's got to bring him home, you know. That's amazing. And then he, yeah, definitely a, a, that, that Depression era sense of yeah. thrift. Yeah. You know, use it till it cannot be used anymore. We didn't find that in his apartment. Though, did no, we? we didn't. <laughs> Sometimes fans would go up to him and say, oh, my God, I love what you did with Spider-Man or I love what you did with that, with this. And he didn't want the fanfare specifically. He wouldn't go to comic conventions. I've heard some explain it to me that the reason why he didn't like that kind of talk is because people who would con him out of working or con him out of ideas use similar language to manipulate him, and he wanted to keep all manipulation away. Is that a correct way of looking at that, or are there other ways of looking at that? I just didn't. Th I don't think he wanted to bother. He didn't like the fanfare, and that was the end of it. That was it. I don't. Yeah, I don't know if he had a reason, but I mean, I think it's kind of like it. Would you have a restaurant and let your customers determine the menu? Yeah. Like it doesn't. You'll never. You oh, can't, that's a good way to. You can't run a successful restaurant yeah. by letting your customers determine oh. what you should serve. Yeah. So why would you care what the fans? There you want? go. So it's almost like don't don't mess with my artistic freedom of chef. choice yeah. to do what I want to express. He's the chef. Don't the put chef. a little extra put a little more parsley in there. Yeah, no. Uh, That's yeah. none of your business. Okay, there you go. Now that I never thought of it like that before. That's great. It seemed like he was visiting a lot in the 50s, 60s, 70s, maybe the 80s, but then to as time goes on, transportation gets harder. From what I understand, his mobility kind of suffered a bit. His vision wasn't as good. And so then you guys stopped getting those visits around 2008 or so. Is that about right? That sounds about right. It could be yeah. a little earlier or right yeah. around there. Yeah. I mean, he, so then, it, you know, it, it was a that, that gradual degradation of like, he'll be here this year. Oh, well, he didn't make it next year. Yeah. Oh, he, well, he didn't make it the year after that either. Oh, now he's here. So mm -hmm. he missed two years mm -hmm. and then he'd get here. You know what I mean? So it just, it literally less often. just less often. And I think his, his knees were bothering him too. His knees. Yeah. I see walking. Just, just yeah. Walking. yeah. That's a heredit and, Ditko hereditary trait. Yeah. His sister and him and okay. me luckily got all that. Did he have eye problems? Well, he wore glasses, but that, not that I know. Yeah, not like macular degeneration yeah, or glaucoma yeah. and all that yeah. stuff. Not that he told us. Yeah. And and he didn't have cataract surgery or anything. As not far that as we would know. Did you guys then keep in touch as he visited less often? Did he? Did you guys write letters or call each other on the phone? I, I used to write him, and uh, it seemed like it was funny. I'd write him, and John would say, hey, you're going to write to Steve. You got a letter from him. So I, I'd write him. But I never wrote anything about what I was doing. Uh, only uh, Betty's feeling this way, and Anne Marie this way, and uh, Joan this way. And he would reply in answering my questions. I mean, my what I said. And uh, he would never say anything about what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Because I never said anything about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So, and then in the beginning, he'd always print his return address, you know. And then all of a sudden, I don't know, after a good while, he finally put on one of his tags, mm. oh. name tags, you know. 
But every He's time I wrote them, I always printed my stuff. Yeah. I would not put my tag on. Does that imply like hand pain or something? Maybe it's a no. Um, it's just a. What he, it's that personal touch. It's that extra effort. Yeah. And it's the 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 handwritten quality I see. versus. But you guys never talked on the phone, really. I called him when he was in a hospital, uh-huh. and uh, he was in Mount Sinai, and. Uh, The girl says, well, who are you? And I says, well, I'm his brother. Can I talk to him? I understand he's in. And then, anyway, she connected me to his room. And he picked up the phone and says, hello. And I says, Yoon, aren't you you in work today? This is a joke because he was always joking with me, so I joked back. And uh, he said, Pat, how's Joan? And we talked for a while. And then he says, The nurse came on and she says, he's sorry, but he has to have his paper and his coffee. He's tired. I said, okay. I says, well, tell him I'll call him back. And I did, but they wouldn't, he wouldn't answer. They wouldn't put me through. Oh. What what do you think that means? He was, uh, he was really failing. Okay. So, so he just didn't want maybe you to hear him like that. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. But uh, How about in earlier years? Would you guys talk on the phone in earlier years? Uh, once in a while. Once in a while. But yeah. you remember, that was long distance. Cost more back then. A lot it cost more. money. Yeah, it did. So, long. I mean, that was something that you, you know, emergencies, yeah. right. big news. Or maybe like, hey, major. I'm going to come down and visit at this time. So I'm sure there were those families that would say, oh, every Sunday I'll call you for 10 minutes, you know, because it was a certain dollar amount that that was a lot, of, you know, right. allocated for that. But otherwise, yeah, right. you didn't just pick up the phone and call people in another state. Yeah. And it looks like he kept souvenirs of Johnstown in his uh, in his place. Is that right? Well, we have the rails, that that rail piece of the incline plane yeah. that Chris sent him. Um yeah, there were pictures too, some pictures, family pictures that Mark had sent him. And, you know, there was some yeah. sentimental stuff there. How close was his studio to his apartment? Well, his last apartment and last studio yeah. were I, 500 I, feet away. I, 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 I get so confused on that thing, I don't even want to, you explain it. <laughs> yeah. so it was really close. Oh, yeah. Oh, Within, yeah. They but different buildings. Yeah. The, the main street that runs yeah. there. He lived on this side. He crossed that street, went into his building wow. on that side. Yeah. So he was even on the same side of whatever, 56th yeah. or whatever it was. He was on the, his office and student and home were on the same side. Yeah, because I think when you sent him mail, you had a. Uh, I don't, that part I never understood. I'm not oh, going to try. Oh, yeah, it was crazy. That was, didn't make sense to me. And I'm not going to try to figure that yeah, one out. Yeah, write it on the envelope so the mailman could understand it. I, yeah. I, I, I never could get it either. I just didn't. Did he ever mention the Atlas Society to you guys? We only would know about the Atlas Society because there was mail from the Atlas Society. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Because he donated to it for like close to 30 years from what oh, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, he cared about he it. He did a lot of that, yeah. Last question, which I thought was interesting from a sentimental note, was this detective Tom Donovan. Yes, Tom Donovan. He's the one who informed you guys about uh, Steve's passing. He called me. He said something that was especially meaningful. What, tell me about how he broke the news. He, he uh, just said that he, thanks to Steve, that's why he's in the he's an officer in a in the police. That uh, he made an impression on him with his, I guess his comic books. Yeah. And uh, when, and then I don't know. I I wrote him. But he never answered me. And then when we went to get his stuff, and we went to the police station, and I asked for him, and he was on vacation or something. Remember? Yeah. yeah so we had know. to go down to the main things. And when we went down to the main place where they kept all this, I they gave us this little booklet with cards in it. And then I says, "Well, where's his glasses?" And the guy says, well, that's all we have. I was still wondering what happened to his class. They weren't in his studio. They weren't in his apartment. Oh, and wow. they weren't among his belongings. Yeah. Okay, so someone it took just, his glasses. It just bothered me because it looks I... Looks like it. 
Yeah. I want to know what his prescription was. <laughs> but so. I never thought of that. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious I wonder about if it. he was far or nearsighted. He was probably nearsighted because you guys are. And uh, usually, a lot of times artists are nearsighted. You just take off your glasses and there it is. That's usually the case. Yeah, yeah. that's why I won't, I won't have surgeries because I wouldn't want to mess with my close vision. So what do you feel we may have missed and what you feel the world should know about? Well, he was really a fun-loving guy. A loving guy. He loved family. Yeah. What do you miss the most about him? Well, I, I sort of like the pranks he'd always pull. You know, he uh, he always come up with something. And uh, that puzzle piece, that was... And I really, 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 and I'm sure you can concur, I liked playing Pinochle with him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a big family event, right? Oh, well, that was... a. Uh, Small war. Yeah. yeah. You guys played for blood. You know, uh, it was serious. Yeah. Like, serious. I was so lucky to get initiated into that club yeah. just yeah. because it was always my uncles that played Pinochle. My dad was like, oh, you know, I'll teach you how to play. And you need three or four people to play. Right. Um, so we used to just play with a, a fake hand. Yeah. So he taught me all the rules. And Uncle one, Steve did. No, my no, dad did. taught me all in advance. And we used to sort of play this sort of fake pinochle to oh, help okay. you understand how yeah, to play. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then one day we went down to his sister's house where he stayed. And there was my dad, my uncle Steve, my uncle Joe. And pinochle is a partner's game. So I got to be the, the fourth. Mm -hmm. So I got to play with all my uncles. It was pretty very intense yeah. for a 13 or 14 year old kid to play with the old the old guard yeah. you know so good game he even worked you know he works pinochle into one of his comic books oh he does i didn't mark yeah. found it oh. and then i asked him which one it was in yeah. oh i'll have to look for it again yeah, like, yeah. there's a story because i did all the titles there's a there's a story and stan lee is credited as the writer mm. but we don't know, right? That yeah, he could have uh, just yeah, yeah. Who so knows who came up with the plot? Right? There's a story called the Mighty Oak. They moved here in 1960. That view that you see going down there, yeah. right in line with that street, yeah. was an oak tree. Yeah, big. You couldn't put your arms. In Three times it. you'd put your arms. Oh, around. I see. And everyone called it the Mighty Oak. Or... No, but I still think oak. that that <laughs> around we have. Eight millimeter footage, they had to have professional tree trimmers come right, up and right. trim it. So those movies of trimming the oak would have been shown at like functions. Yeah. So I often wonder if the Mighty Oak wasn't a story that was generated from our oak. That's cool. that, that disappeared. Well, this was a lot of fun. I loved it. This uh I really appreciate you guys inviting me here and uh Ooh. you know, taking me through um, you know, your story and your relationship with uh, Steve Ditko and it's great to hear it. And we're just glad to get out uh, some of the truth of, of the yeah. type of person that he was. That's right. And I think that's the objective anyway, is to get the truth out there. There's a lot of speculation, and it's silly and weird. And there's from different sides of fandom. People that are kind of pro-Marvel have a false a recluse kind of. And then people on the Ditko side will almost even get a little too much, say, oh, tuberculosis just destroyed him, and yada, yada, and read into things that weren't real. There's a real person in between all this. And so it's nice to have that. And especially with people that have the evidence, too, that aren't just giving hearsay.